is bliss. That's the attitude that some of us have about things in our lives. We say, what I, what I don't know, I, I don't want to know, you know? Um, and maybe that works in some things in life. But I want to suggest to you today that ignorance about spiritual matters is not bliss. It's the exact opposite. I'm going to suggest to you today that having that attitude about Christ and about our need for Him and, and about who we are and, and why we need Christ, just to say, well, I don't know and I'll find out when I get there, is not the right attitude to have that Christ would call us to something greater. Um, the, the de- the, actually, that phrase, ignorance is bliss, actually is in the dictionary. And uh, it's sort of a proverb that made the kind of the dictionary. And it says, if you don't know about something, you don't worry about it. Well, there are some things that we should. We should take the ignorance that we have and acknowledge it and say, Lord, I need to know. And today I want to talk to you, as we're continuing this series on the life of Peter, about Peter's ignorance and ours. Peter's such an interesting character, isn't it, as we've been going through studying the life of Peter. But one thing is very clear about Peter. Peter was ignorant about some things, just like we can be. And I want to suggest to you today that Peter was ignorant about his need for Christ, even as he was confessing Christ. He really didn't fully understand Christ until after his death and resurrection. And sometimes, even in our confession of Christ, we don't understand the depth of his love for us. But ignorance about Christ is not bliss. Ignorance about Christ is damning. We need to know who Christ is. We need to know what He has done for us. We need to know our great need for Christ. And I want to share with you that today as we study that in the life of Peter. The other thing that Peter was ignorant about was about his weaknesses. Now, about his need for Christ, we'll see today that as Jesus stoops down to wash Peter's feet, Peter at first says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? No, you shall never wash my feet. He was ignorant about his need of Christ to be his Savior, to wash his feet. And we'll see how Jesus reveals that Peter needs Christ to be the one who washes his feet and what that means for us. But about the second ignorance that he had, ignorance about his own weaknesses, we've seen that time and time again in the life of Peter. We've seen how proud and even boastful Peter is about himself and how, how well he thinks he's doing. And, and we'll see in another incident where when Jesus says, you're all going to fall away, every one of you is going to fall away. When I'm betrayed and when I'm taken to the trial and the crucifixion, you're all going to fall away. And of course, Peter, rather than being humble and saying, oh Lord, may it never be. No, no. Peter has to, in his boastful pride, say, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. It's laughable. But, you know, we know the whole story, right? We know what's going to follow in the life of Peter. So today we're going to see that Peter displays his ignorance about his need for Christ and even his ignorance about his profound weaknesses. And the two go together because our weaknesses, a knowledge of our weakness to draw us to look to Christ for the, as the answer for that weakness. And I want to think with you today about that. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 13. John chapter 13 through 17 all happens in the same night. It happens on the night of betrayal. It's Thursday, sundown into Friday. And on that particular day, that night, Jesus is preparing his disciples for what is about to happen his betrayal, his crucifixion, his death, and ultimately his resurrection on the third day. And as he gathers the disciples around, he actually gathers them together for a Passover meal. And he institutes a new Passover meal, the celebration that we are going to partake of in just a few minutes around the table, the Lord's Supper. But before he has this Passover celebration, he teaches them some things. He doesn't just speak to them. He shows them. Look at what he does. Look at John chapter 13, verse 1. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. The hour he was referring to is not an hour as in 60-minute hour, but the hour, the time of testing that he was about to undergo 
He knew that it was coming. He knew that it was right. The next tick of the clock would bring him to that hour. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them even till the end. He was going to press forward with that to the very end and die, knowing that that was the only way to bring salvation to his people. Look at verse 2. The evening meal was in progress, so they were around the table having the evening meal. And what would happen in an evening meal? Well, what would happen, we sort of think of tables and chairs. They really didn't have that. They had a low table, and then they had cushions. And People would be seated at a, that this small table, so to say, and they would be seated on a cushion, and they would be facing the table, and their feet would be pointed away, away from the table. So their, their, their head was facing the table, but their feet were away. It was sort of a little different than the way we are. We ha- would have our face and our, our feet both facing the table. They would have their feet away. Why? Because Typically, their feet were dirty. They had walked the roads, the dusty roads, and so they would put their feet away. And I want you to notice what happens. That evening, while the meal was in progress, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus, already Peter, uh, Judas had this plan to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. He understood that he had come from heaven. The eternal Son of God had taken on human flesh, and he had come for this very moment in his life to be able to offer himself and lay down his life for the salvation of the world. He knew this day was coming. And what did he do? The Bible says that he began to go around the table with a basin of water and wash the feet of his disciples one by one. And it describes how he had actually taken off his outer garment. And so now he was only wearing his undergarment, which was was sort of what a slave would wear when he was serving his master. And he took a towel around his waist And he went from disciple to disciple, washing their feet. Why? When a person went to a very special meal, they would take a bath. They would wash their body. But the minute that they walked out of their house, they walked onto the dusty roads of Israel. And what would happen? Their feet would become dirty and encrusted with mud. They would show up at someone's house and their body would be clean, but their feet would be filthy. And a good host would provide a basin of water where a guest could take off their sandals and wash their feet so that they had clean feet with a clean body to be able to eat. And then they would do the ceremonial washing of the hands. So a good host would provide that. And in a richer, I should say, a rich family that had servants, particularly Gentile servants, because even Jewish servants, it was sort of a little too beneath them. Gentile servants would sometimes wash people's feet. Sometimes even very submissive wives, where's my wife, would do that for their husbands, but usually not. And from the look of it, it doesn't look like that's going to happen for me. But no, no nobleman, no teacher, no rabbi would do what Jesus is just about to do as he begins to wash his disciples' feet one by one. What an intimate act. What an act of love. What an act of humility. What an act of service to stoop down. Why is Jesus doing this? In so many ways, I think Jesus is showing us what he has already done. The Bible describes this in Philippians chapter 2. Who being in, the very, being in very nature God, the eternal Son of God, did not consider equality with God, where the angels worshipped Him, adored Him. He didn't consider equality with God something to be held on to at no cost. But He emptied Himself, taking the very nature of a servant And that's exactly what he was doing before their eyes. He was acting out the very act that he had performed from the foundation of the world and agreeing to come from heaven to earth. He was now showing them this is exactly what it looks like. I'm taking on the form of a servant and I'm going to serve each one of you sacrificially. 
Look at verse 6. He came to Simon Peter. Now, now we're already ready. We're, we've already seen enough zingers from Simon Peter. Notice it doesn't seem like any of the other disciples said anything. They were probably just so shocked and shell-shocked and didn't know what to say. Our rabbi master's washing our feet. I, I don't understand this, but, but Peter, you know, bless his heart. Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Well, what does it look like? I, you know, I could just think, Jesus, you know, I, I'd be sarcastic. I'd be, what does it look like, Peter? I've already washed all the other feet, you know. But he doesn't. He just lets Peter speak. Jesus, though, uh, responds to him, you do not realize what I am doing, but later on you will understand. He was so patient with Peter. He understood that a lot of things that he was doing for Peter would not be understood at the moment, but later on they would. And here's Peter again. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Notice what Jesus said to him. Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. In other words, unless you receive the fact that I am humbling myself and willing to serve you and, and wash your sins away, because this is symbolic of the sins that we have accumulated in life, Unless you're willing to let me wash you, you can't be a part of me. That's so important. You see, some of us are ignorant of our need of Christ and His work of redemption in us. None of us can stand before a holy God with our soiled feet. Only Christ can make us clean. Unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And then Peter, he just totally switches from the one minute you can't do this to, all right, well, then wash my whole body. Yeah, I just love the way Peter just switches from one to the other, on and off, hot and cold, whatever. But then the Lord says to him, no, 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 that's not necessary. Those who have had a bath, remember when a person left their house, they had had a bath, their whole body was clean. The only problem was their feet had become soiled as they went from their home to the other home. They were already clean. He says, no, no, those who have had a bath only need to wash their feet. Their whole body is already clean. And then he says, and you are clean. You see, remember Peter had confessed Christ as his Messiah, his Savior, just, just a few weeks before, right, on the mountain near Mount Hermon, he had said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, and Jesus had said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. The very moment that Peter had embraced Jesus as his Messiah and his Savior, he had been cleansed, been washed. He was already clean. But as we walk through life, our feet get soiled again and again. Here's the thing. The very moment that you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, let me ask you, have you done that? Have you come before God and said, Oh God, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. Oh Lord, forgive me. Oh Lord, wash me and cleanse me of my sins. Have you done that? If you've, if you've done that and meant that in your heart and called upon Christ to be your Savior, you are already clean. There is no need to have another bath. You are washed clean. The baptism that we practice in our church is an outward sign of that inner washing that's already happened. The Bible talks about this as a renewing and a washing of us through the Holy Spirit. And that happens the very moment when we hear the Word of God and believe it and trust in Christ as our Savior. We are washed clean. We've already had a bath. But the reality is, is that as we live our Christian lives, we get soiled feet. Because although we have now been cleansed and, and made right with God, we still battle with the sinful nature within us. And as we walk the dusty roads of life, we, we get accumulations of, of dust and sin in our lives, and it gets encrusted sometimes and filled with mud. In our, and, and so we need to be continually washed. Our feet needs to be continually washed because we're accumulating that, that battle with sin and we give in. And so we, we have this need no longer to have our body washed. We are in right standing with God. The Bible says that once we, we confess Christ as our Lord, we are justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a once and for all washing that happens to us as the Holy Spirit comes to live in us and transforms us and makes us born again. But as we go through life, we're still battling with, this, 
with the dust and dirt of sin in our lives, and our feet get soiled, and we need continual cleansing. That's why in 1 John chapter 1, it says that if we, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us ongoing forgiveness, ongoing washing of our feet, and cleanse us of all sins. We need that continual washing. So, so Jesus is telling Peter, on the one hand, you've already had a bath, but you need to have your feet continually washed. If you, if you do not acknowledge that, you can't be a part of me. And Christians need to be continually aware of the fact that although we've been cleansed of our past life, we need to continue to be confessing our sins to the Lord because we will have soiled feet through life. And, and Jesus is telling us this is the way of discipleship of, of a Christian. A Christian needs to be bathed by the Holy Spirit. Their sins need to be washed away once and for all. They need to be made clean in God's sight. And then throughout their lives, they need to be in continual practice of confessing their sins and asking God to, to cleanse their soiled feet. Jesus is saying that is the way of the Christian life. There's no other way. If you don't want to walk that way of being bathed and having your feet washed regularly by Jesus, then Jesus says to you, as he said to Peter, you have no part in me. That is the Christian life. We can't be ignorant about our need for Christ and His continual washing of our lives. And, and we can never say to the Lord, No, Lord, you may never wash my feet. To say that is to push the Savior away. And Peter was in danger of doing that until he understood, No, I can't do that. As the evening continues, they get to the end of the meal. And in Matthew chapter 26, we say one, see one more incident that happens. Again, Peter speaks before he thinks. Just love the guy. Matthew chapter 26, verse 33, shows us at the very end of the evening. So this is all happening on Thursday night into Friday morning, the very day before Jesus dies. At the end of the meal, at the very end of the meal, Jesus tells his disciples, hey, guys, I got bad news for you. Every one of you is going to fall away. When the shepherd is struck, all the sheep will scatter. He quotes a prophecy of the Old Testament, and he says, that speaks of me. I'm the great shepherd. You guys are the sheep, and you guys are going to run. <laughs> you're going to run away. All of you are going to run away because you're going to be scared because what's about to happen is I'm going to be betrayed, and I'm going to be brought before the Roman authorities and the Jewish authorities, and I'm going to be crucified, and it's going to be awful, and you're going to run from me. And of course, Peter, rather than saying, oh, Lord... Oh, Lord, help me. Help me to be strong in that hour. No, Peter, in his boastful pride, because he's ignorant of his, of his weaknesses. See, it's dangerous to be ignorant of our weaknesses. He's ignorant of it. And so look at what he says in verse 33. Peter replied after the Lord had told them, hey, this is going to happen. Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Verse 35, even after Jesus says, nah, it's not going to be that way, he, he doubles down. It's like he doubles down. He has a bad hand, you know, and he doubles down. Verse 35, but Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples followed Peter and said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah. oh yeah, we agree. Well, they're all going to fall away. And very shortly, we're going to see exactly how this happens. And, and Peter should be aware of his own weakness, but he's not. And so here's what the great news of the gospel is. Christ knows Peter. Christ knows Peter's weakness. And yet he still chose him. Here's even better news. Christ knows my weakness and he still puts up with me. He still loves me. He still longs to use me. Even though he knows my weakness. Christ knows your weakness. He knows in the face of temptation how sometimes so easily we give in. He knows that. And what does he say? Here's what he says to Peter. Look at verse 32. He says, no, Peter, you think you're going to withstand this trial. You're not. You're going to be, you're going to fail. But he says, after I've risen... I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He already knows Peter's going to fail and go to Galilee and start trying to fish again. And Jesus is going to go follow him and 
seek him out. That's what Jesus does to his followers. He understands our weakness, and he says, no, despite it, I'm going I'm to chase after you. I'm going to go into Jerusalem. I'm going to track you down. I'm not giving up on you that easy. In fact, in a parallel passage, um, in Luke chapter 22, he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you. Here's what Jesus does in the face of our weakness. He prays for us. And he says, I'm praying for you that your faith may not fail. He doesn't want us to fail, even though he knows that we're weak. And he says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus already knows that Peter's going to fail. And he already knows that he's going to call him back. And when he turns back, he's going to give him a calling to strengthen his brothers in the face of his own weakness and failure. That's how Jesus treats us too. Jesus sees our weakness, but says, I, I'm still praying for you. And when you turn back, I'm going to give you a calling in a ministry. We can't be ignorant about our need for Christ. We can't be ignorant about our weaknesses. And the two go hand in hand, don't they? Think about the Apostle Peter as Jesus is washing the feet. Oh, Lord, never. You can't wash my feet. And he realizes, unless he lets Christ wash his feet, he will never be clean. He will always have a dirty body and soiled feet. And the truth of the matter is, if you and I don't realize that, if we're ignorant about our need for Christ, that ignorance is not bliss. That ignorance is damning. Because the only thing that keeps us from eternal life is not the individual sins that we do, as, as, as serious as those are, but our unbelief and our refusal to go to the only one who can wash us clean of those sins and keep us our feet clean on an ongoing basis. So let me ask you today, have you, have you gone to Christ in the stillness of your heart, Maybe it was in an auditorium like now where you're hearing a preacher speak or maybe it was in your own, the own quiet of your own room and you said, oh God, I am a sinner. Wash me. I need to be washed clean. I need the bathing of the Holy Spirit in my life. Have, have you done that? Have you, have you turned to Christ who alone can make you clean? Ignorance about that is, is a... Ignorance that cannot be left unchallenged. The other ignorance relates to it. It's ignorance of our own weakness. It's, it's ignorance of not knowing and not being able to see what's behind us, what's in front of us. It's ignorance of our own propensity to fail and to sin, our weakness. And when we face it head on, it draws us back to Christ. When we realize Oh, Lord, I am weak. How more do I need you than ever before? It brings us to Christ. And so these two ignorances, ignorance of Christ and ignorance of our weakness, can only be solved through coming to Jesus and allowing Him to wash us, to clean us, and to tell us, I'm praying for you. And when you return... I want to give you a task and a job to serve me too. I believe that Jesus wants to say that to us today. He wants us to serve him. He wants us to love him. He knows that we fail, but he loves us nevertheless. And he calls us into fellowship with him and service with him. Do you have that kind of relationship with Jesus? Jesus.